Last topic, internet applications. So we're at the last or the top topmost layer in our five layer stack. So we've gone all the way from physical layer, physical layer up until application layer. And this is quite a, a short topic. We're just going to give one example of an internet application. Briefly mention what do we mean by internet applications. Talk about the concept of naming and then go through an example with web browsing. We'll go through this quickly mainly because you know it already. You know about domain names, maybe not formally but you use them all the time and you know about web browsing and, and the basics of how it works. An internet application is some piece of software that involves communication with other applications <laughs> in order to achieve their objectives. That is, web browser is an internet application which communicates with a web server. The objective of using these applications is to view content on a remote computer. That is, the web server is the remote computer. The objective is to make that content available to multiple people on different computers. So most internet applications have three basic components. So we can divide the components into a user interface. That may be something for configuring a server or a graphical user interface that the end user looks at. The application logic, that is the functionality that is specific to that application. For example, a web browser has to parse the HTML to work out how to display it on the screen. That's part of the, the parser is part of the application logic. An email client as an application, well the logic is different there. It needs to be able to uh, allow you to save files, open files to add as attachments and so on. So there's a user interface, the, the core component of what the application does and then there's the part that does the communication that handles communicating with the other endpoint. So internet applications, we have to provide a service to the user, we have uh, an application running on multiple computers. It may be the same application, uh, a, voice, uh, a voice over IP client like Skype software communicating with another voice over IP client on someone else's computer, or maybe different applications like a web browser communicating with a web server. We're going to focus on the communications part of it, which is implemented by an application layer protocol. There are many different internet applications, as you know. I think you know and you use these on a regular basis. And those different internet applications may use different application layer protocols and also languages used within those, by those different applications. Web browsing uses, for example, HTTP as the application layer protocol. So the communications between web browser and web server is using HTTP. Between a voice over IP client and voice software and another one maybe use a different protocol, RTP for example. So different applications will use different communication protocols. Some of them are listed here. Instant messaging, when you start a, a Microsoft instant messaging client, then when it sends a message across the network, it will use a Microsoft specific network protocol. And one of them was called MSNP. File transfer, FTP, torrent based applications, Database access, when you access a database remotely, there are specific protocols for transferring that information from your client to the server. And many other applications, including custom applications, things that maybe as the end users we don't use so much, but inside businesses, then they usually will often will have custom applications that are built for their business and may use their own application layer protocols. So when you go out and work, maybe one part of your job will be to create an application that 
allows the management of different devices in a factory, then you may have to write your own communications protocol to allow the different devices to, com to communicate with each other. So there are many different applications and application layer protocols. We're going to focus just on one, web browsing. Most of these applications follow a client-server model. The client initiates communications. Last lecture, let's take someone up the front. <laughs> you, come up the front. Quick. You can sit here. No, just have a seat down the front. <laughs> There's no rush. We can go into lunch. We have to finish this topic. There's no rush. You've got all afternoon. Have you had a lecture this afternoon? Okay, so we can continue lecturing this afternoon. Then hurry up and sit down. <laughs> Internet applications, most of them follow a client-server model. It's okay, you can see clearly. <laughs> and you can ask questions easily. The client initiates communications, the server sits there, runs, and just does nothing until the client contacts it. That's a common model that we see with internet applications. The application layer protocols use the transport protocol for data delivery. So if we want to send an email, then the application layer protocol for email handles the formatting of email messages and getting them delivered to the right destination, to the right inbox. The delivery, the reliable delivery of the email across the internet is handled by TCP. TCP will make sure that when we send an email, if it will break it into segments and if something's lost along the way, then it will do a retransmission and make sure that the entire email is delivered to the endpoint. So the application layers use the transport protocols. They use one transport protocol normally, and they choose the one that's most appropriate for what they need. When you, when you write, uh, one thing we miss, most internet applications are implemented as user-level software processes, that is, your operating system is running usually in a protected mode. The normal user cannot modify the operating system. But an internet application is normally uh, running in a user level mode where the, the user can install their own application. You can install your own web browser, for example. When you want to write your own application, then your application layer protocol needs to make use of a transport layer protocol. That transport layer protocol is part of the operating system. TCP and UDP are some software in your OS. You write your application, you need to use TCP or UDP. There's a common API, a programming interface for applications to access the transport protocols and it's called the sockets interface. So an API really defines a set of function calls or methods in different languages such that when you write your application for your new fancy web browser in Java, then when you want to send something with TCP, you call a, uh, a method which is send or send via TCP. And in fact, the interface that you use in Java is probably the same as what you use in C or if you write something in Perl or any other language. That is, all the languages use this common interface for accessing the transport layer, the sockets interface. What that means is once you know the interface, it's very easy to program internet-based applications, the communications part, because it doesn't matter what language you're using, it doesn't matter what operating system you're using, it's the same interface. We will see examples, or in fact you will write your own 
sockets-based application next semester if you take the lab. If you pass this course, <laughs> then you can take the lab next semester and we'll write a basic application using sockets. And as a result, using a common interface, I can write a Java-based web server which will communicate with a C-based, a, a Java-based web browser with a C-based web server, for example. And using the same interface, but using different languages, running on different operating systems, if we use the same application layer protocol, then they'll be able to communicate. One thing that's common to most internet applications is naming. Naming resources and naming computers. So far we know that we use IP addresses to identify interfaces, usually computers in the internet. We use port numbers to identify what? Port numbers identify what? Applications. Applications. <laughs> Protocol numbers identify Protocol numbers identify <laughs> specifically, more specific, transport protocols. Okay. Protocol number identifies the transport protocol. Port numbers the application. <coughs> IP addresses identify the host or the network interface. These are used by our com computers to communicate. We need some user friendly names so us humans can remember the names of different computers and that's where we get domain names and also that we can refer to specific resources on computers files for example so let's briefly look at naming and DNS so we have IP addresses identify computer interfaces domain names are a user-friendly way to identify computers and I think you know this you know you know domain names, you know their structure, that they're in some hierarchical structure where we have top-level domains. We may have country code, top-level domains. And within there, there's some hierarchy. There's .co.th, uh, .ac.th, and so on. So there's a hierarchy of those dom domain names. Those domain names identify computers and they map to specific IP addresses. Your, the protocols use IP addresses to communicate, IP, the internet protocol, but us humans enter in domain names regularly. Therefore, we need some way that when I type in a domain name, my computer knows the IP address that I mean by that domain name. And that's what DNS does. In addition to domain names, we need to sometimes be more specific and refer to a resource, some file on a computer. And we get URLs and URIs. So again, you know, I think, you use them all the time. You know the general structure. You may not know the complete structure. Uh, but you know a URL is used to locate some resource, a file, on the internet. It identifies the host computer and some file on that host computer. And some more information is included in the URL. In fact, there's a more generic form which is called the Uniform Resource Identifier. So there's a URI. URL is one part of, or one specific form of a URI, and there, is a, there are others as well, URNs, Uniform Resource Names. But the most common we use is URLs. The general format of these are that we specify the scheme or the application protocol that we'll use to access a resource. We may specify the user who's authorised to access a resource, they give their username. Specify the host, the computer, where we want to access the resource on. Usually we give a domain name or an IP address, both are possible. We may specify the port number to identify the server application that we want to communicate with and give a path to a particular file. And we can optionally give some query to query that file. Some of them are described here. 
there are some more options available and there are many exceptions to this scheme. But I think you've seen them, especially with web browsing. With web browsing, the application protocol is HTTP. That's the scheme used to access a resource. Here's an example of a domain name which identifies a host. That's the device that we want to access the resource on. And then we have slash dir slash file.html, which is the path to the actual resource. So we want to access the resource file.html in the directory dir on the computer identified by this domain name using the protocol HTTP. With a web browser, normally it will assume if you use HTTP as the scheme that the port number is port 80. You don't have to type in the port number. If you want to use a different port number, you can type it in. Here, 40240 is an example of specifying a specific port number. And of course, we can specify an IP address instead of domain name. We can give queries. So there's some more options to give queries. And also, we have formats for emails, for remote login, and for many other internet applications they use these uniform resource identifiers. Here's an example where I can connect to a remote computer. Example.com is the remote computer. I'll supply my username, my password, whatever my password is, specify the port I want to connect to using the protocol telnet, allow me to log in to a remote computer. You used Secure Shell when you did your assignment to log into the IT server. So the, and there are many other examples. Importantly, when we type in the domain name, like in those examples, for your computer to contact this computer on the internet, we can't use the domain name. We must use its IP address. So if I type in a domain name in the address bar of my web browser and press enter, my computer to, to send a message needs to know the IP address of this server. The domain name's not very useful to send IP packets. We need to know the IP address. So somehow we need to map a domain name into an IP address, whatever it may be. And the system that's used to perform this mapping is called DNS. In the simplest terms, the DNS protocol takes as an input or a query a domain name and returns as an output an IP address. That is, you ask the DNS system, what is the IP address for this domain name? And DNS should return to you, the IP address is this. That's the idea. Uh, and the name of the DNS uh, and the IP stored in the every DNS server, or DNS server have to ask for answer? H how, does it, how does it return this answer? It can be quite complex. We'll briefly mention how it may return the answer, but we won't in fact have time to cover through all that. Yes, we have special servers that store this mapping. That's the basic approach. So if this is my computer running, running my web browser, I type in a d the domain name, which means I want to contact this server my computer to send a, a message out onto the internet needs to know the destination IP address. So what it does, maybe it's out here somewhere, so here's the actual server. All I know at the moment is the domain name, I need to know the IP address. So how DNS works is that there's some special servers throughout the internet, DNS servers, 
that store the mapping from domain name to IP address. So this may have a database which stores that our example domain name this DNS server will have a database that stores the mapping from some domain name to some IP address. That is, when this computer starts, it's got an IP address, it has a domain name, it must tell some DNS server, this domain name is accessible via this IP address. That is, the mapping from domain to IP. It tells the server, this server stores it in some database, and maybe other DNS servers store it as well, there's not just one. And now, my browser knows the domain name, it needs to know the IP address. To find the IP address, it sends a special message out onto the internet to the DNS servers saying, what is the IP address for this domain name? And there's a hierarchy of DNS servers. So if I send it to this DNS server and it doesn't know, it doesn't have it in its database, then it may send it onto another DNS server. This one knows, so it's a request really, what is the IP address for this domain? Think of it as a query saying, give me the IP address for this domain. If this one doesn't have the answer, then it may send it onto another server. sends the query to another server. If this one has the answer, then it can send back the reply. The answer is 72.16.3.4. And this one can send it back. That's the basics of DNS. There are DNS servers. End servers register their domain names with DNS servers. Those DNS servers store the mappings in a database. The clients, when they have a domain name, send a query to a DNS server asking for the corresponding IP address. And when the query response comes back, now my browser knows the IP address, or my computer knows the IP address. And now I can form an IP datagram, which has the destination address set to 72.16.3.4. Remember, our IP datagrams, the addresses are IP addresses. They're not domain names. We must have an IP address. That's it. That's about all we want to cover with DNS. We don't have time to cover the details. It needs a, an entire lecture to go into much more detail than that. Some of it's listed here. Again, we'll see some example, or one example today, and you will see more examples in the labs next semester. So DNS takes some domain name as input, provides some IP address as output. There are specific pro there's a DNS protocol for sending this query, and there's ways to manage the DNS servers so it's efficient to get a quick response. So naming, we have domain names, we have URLs, we have the DNS system or the domain name system that provides the mapping from domain names to IP addresses. Once I know an IP address, I can send an IP datagram. We'll see an example when we go through HTTP, after I go through web browsing. So we want to look at just one very simple internet application, web browsing, and look at the, an application layer protocol, HTTP. Everyone knows how web browsing applications work. Let's talk about how HTTP works, the hypertext transfer protocol, a protocol for transferring hypertext from some server to a client. The hypertext is uh, the format of the content normally used on the servers for web browsing.
and it's written in HTML, the Hypertext Markup Language. HTTP is a request response protocol. Your client sends a request, the client, we have some server, we send a request to the server requesting some resource. The server has a set of resources available and sends back the, the request of resource in some response. So two general types of message, a HTTP request and a HTTP response. And it's quite simple from that perspective because we just send one request, get one response. And that's always the case. We will look at the formats of those messages in, in a moment. HTTP is considered a stateless protocol. In the basic form, when I send a request for a resource, I'll get one response. Then maybe five seconds later, I want to send another request to the same server for another resource, I'll get a response. That second request and response has no relationship to the previous one. From HTTP's perspective, once the, we get a response, then that protocol interaction is finished. We don't care about what happened in the past. I send a request for a file, I get the file. I send a request again sometime later, even if it's for the same file then HTTP doesn't keep track of what's happened in the past. There's no state maintained between subsequent requests. They're independent. That's the theory of HTTP. In practice, we have mechanisms for maintaining some state. We have things like cookies that are stored at clients and servers and related information so that the server knows that if it receives a request from your browser, the server knows that you're the person who requested five seconds ago this previous file. And so the server can track who is accessing and do things like provide logins and provide um, personalized services. But from the protocol perspective, we just send one request and get one response. The name, the formal name of the client is a user agent. So your web browser is a client in HTTP. It's called a user agent. And we have a web server. By default, the server uses port number 80. And your client uses port number, what port number does your client use? Client. Your server uses a port 80. What does your client use? It uses, what, does, what port number does a web browser, that is a client, use? It uses a dynamic port. Or any, any. Or almost any, any within some range that's unused. There's a range of ports which are called dynamic ports. They are allocated by the operating system to your web browser. So there's no fixed port number for your web client, your web browser. Dynamically, yeah. Ba the basic rules within some range and it should not be used by your current computer. So the operating system and manages in that. In when we do the browser, uh, when we open and display uh, in an folder, once apply the portable for that application and when we close the browser and reopen again, they get the display or the same port number. When you open your browser, in fact, you may have multiple parallel connections at the same time, so you may have multiple port numbers in use, not just one per browser, because in now in browsers you can have multiple tabs. Okay, multiple ports. And also within one page, you may have multiple connections established. So you can have multiple ports. And when we close and open again, it's the same number as the previous section or not? You need to use an unused port number. So when you establish, for example, a TCP connection, that TCP connection, we open the connection, transfer some data using one port number, and then when we close the connection, then we can think that that port number becomes released, available. So it may be the same or not? It may be the same. Usually there's some time associated with it. Do not reuse it within two minutes after using it in the past. Yeah. After that time, you can reuse that. 
and the operating system manages that. The generic format of the HTTP message, both requests and responses, we have a single line at the start. They're just text messages. They're just a set of characters. There's no, well, there's a concept of a header, but we cannot, we don't normally draw it like we've drawn TCP segments and uh, IP datagrams. We think of it as a, a, a set of uh, characters, a set of lines. There's a start line, and the start line differs for the request and response. We'll show that in a moment. We can have some optional header lines where each line has a header field name followed by the value of that field name. They're optional. They don't have to be included. We'll see some examples. There are many different fields that can be included. Then we have an empty line, nothing, or space, and the optional message body, especially in the response. If we send a request for a resource, the response will contain that resource. If I request a file, the response will contain that file, the contents of that file. That's the message body. Okay, so that's included in particular in the responses. Let's look at the structure or some examples of those formats. Oh, this is a general uh, diagram of the exchange. The at step one, the user types into an address bar some URL, as an example. You open your web browser, you go to the address bar and you type in some URL, which identifies a destination server and a resource on that server. Here's our server, and our server is our server computer. So as the computer, it's running web server software. So a web server is just some software, a software application. And one thing that a web server does is that it makes a set of files on that computer available to clients. So there'll be some <coughs> files available on this computer, let's say, these are some of the files available. Let's say on our server there are four files available there for clients to access, so publicly available. And they are organized in some hierarchy where we have some di root directory, some subdirectories, potential subdirectories, and some file names. So when the user at step one types in a URL in the address bar of their browser, When they type this in and press enter, then what happens? What happens first? DNS happens first. Before HTTP is used, we need to know the IP address for this domain name. So DNS finds that given this domain name, it actually represents some IP address. That's not part of HTTP, it's separate. But it's needed for HTTP to work because if we're going to send a datagram across the internet, we need to know the IP address of this computer. Let's give it, a, let's say this is the 72.16.3.4. So DNS goes to work <coughs> and then HTTP goes to work. And what happens is your web browser creates a request message and the start line of the request message looks like this. It's just 
a text string starting with the word get to indicate we want to retrieve a resource, to get a resource. The resource path, slash test dot slash index dot html, this part. We don't need to include the domain name in the request here, just the path. Because we're sending it to the server identified by that domain name. So we don't need to include it in there. And in fact, although it's not shown here, we also include a version of the protocol, something like HTTP slash 1.1 at the end. And then we may include some optional fields. In this simple example, there are no optional fields. So we send a request to the server. In fact, the web browser creates this request, sends it to TCP. TCP establishes a connection to the server and then sends the request to the server using IP. But from HTTP's perspective, we send a request to the server. The server receives the request, see, sees what resource was requested, and checks whether it has that resource available. The client requests a slash test slash index.html. That's one of the four files available. Therefore, the server, assuming everything's OK in terms of authorization, the server reads this file and puts it into the response and sends back the contents of this file in the response. And the response has some structure where the first line in indicates the protocol and the version being used, and then some status code. That is the status of this response. Was the request successful? Was it OK? In this case, yes, it's OK. Or in another case, maybe it would not be OK and would give a reason why it was not OK here. We give her a status code and then a space followed by the contents of the file that was requested. So this is just indicating, OK, it was some HTML file. So the actual contents of that file will be included in the message there. It's sent back. The browser re receives the, request, uh, the response, checks, OK, everything's OK, reads the contents of the file, and uses that content to display something on the screen. So in this case, uses the, the markup, the HTML, to display some title at the top of your, address, uh, of your web browser and some content in your web browser. That's the very basics of HTTP. Let's look at the structure of some of those messages. The request message. We saw in this example there was a start line, which is get the resource. I didn't write it, but there should also be a protocol version here. The general format is the method that we're using. The method may be get. There are others. Post is a common one you'll see as well. Get is if you want to retrieve a resource. Post if, if you want to get the server to process some information that you're sending to it. And there are other methods that you can use. No. Get, so this is, this is data being sent from the client to the server. And in HTTP, we send a request. We want to ask for some resource. I want to get the file slash test slash index.html from your, from your hard drive. Yes. And the response will contain that file. So ask for a file, receive that file. And uh, accompany with OK, they send HTML file. Yes. This is in the one response, all of this. It contains a line saying the status of that response and the contents of that file. That's the status code. We'll see some examples, some more examples, but that's saying that, so this is a status code, 200, and this is the reason that it's a textual description of that code, which means that your request was okay. There are other numbers. The request 
as a method, the most common one we see is get. We want to retrieve something from a server. The URL, that is the resource that we want to retrieve. And also the version of the protocol, HTTP slash 1.0 or 1.1, whichever version your browser is using. That's the start line for the request. Each request may have some optional header lines. We'll see some potential header lines in a moment. The response we saw contained a status line or a start line. It has some optional header lines, which we haven't seen yet. And then the contents, the message body. In the start line of the response, we include the version of the protocol being used by the server, status code, and the status reason, where the reason is just some textual explanation for that status code. 404. 404 is one you've seen before. The most common one, if everything's OK, is 200 OK. Status code 200, status reason OK. Other one that you've probably seen, 404 not found. Send a request. And the other parts. If we send a request for slash test slash page 2.html, the server doesn't have that resource. Therefore, can send back 404. not found. And there's no message body in that case. There's just the start line to say that the resource you requested is not available at this server. We don't have it. That's, that's the HTTP response that comes back. Your web browser, when it receives such a response, may display a message on the screen. And it depends on the web browser what that message is. I don't know if we can give an example. What's okay, there's an example. <laughs> what I did, I typed in a URL. So I triggered and pressed enter. That triggers my web browser to create a request. It created a request. In fact, before it created the request, it had to find the corresponding IP address for ICT.SIT. It has an IP address. Creates a, a GET request requesting this resource. Sent it to the server. The server looked in its directory to see whether it had the file ABC.HTML. It did not. So the server sent back a 404 not found message. When my browser received that message, <coughs> it displayed this message on the screen. Uh, that's the message that's displayed on the screen. <laughs> uh, the reason is, so I'm 90, 95% 90, sure it sent this response. Uh, let's see what the server does in our web server. Um, I think our server, our the ICT web server is configured to, if you request, <laughs> if you request something that's not available, I requested a file, I know it doesn't exist because I've <coughs> created this directory, the server, the server, instead of sending not found in this case, it says you cannot check whether it exists or not. You have no <coughs> permission to access it. Let's see if we can give a better example. You're right, that's not a good example. Uh, a different server. I'm not sure if that will work either. Okay, that's a better example. We're sure that what happened there, we sent a request to the Google web server. Google web server sent back 404 not found as a message and when, when your browser receives that, 
it prints this error. Actually, it's not that simple either. Uh, I think what's happened here is that it may not have even sent a 404 not found back. It may have sent back a, a special message. Google's web server may be even smarter, so it sends back a response that says, uh, that includes an image and includes this fancy message. So it's not easy to find a good example. <laughs> but I think you understand the point here, that if we request a resource that's not available on the server, the server will send back a message saying it's not available, and that will display some error type message on your browser. The type of error that's displayed is going to depend upon what the server has configured to respond with, and just depend upon your web browser. If you do it on a different web browser, it may just display something different. We may have one more example of that later. And there are others. So that's one, you know, 200 OK, 404 not found. I think the one you saw on the ICT server was forbidden. You do not have permission to access that resource. 403 forbidden. The request was understood, but the server refuses to process that. I think that's what happened when we contacted the ICT server. Some you may see, you know, when you contact, when you download the quiz answers and the lecture notes from the lecture course, the website, you need to supply your username and password. If you supply the wrong username and password, the server may send back, or if you supply no username and password, may send back 401 unauthorized. You're unauthorized to access this resource. And another one, maybe 304 not modified. You send a request for slash index.html. The server sends back in 200 OK. One minute later, you send a request to the same server for the same file slash index.html. Instead of the server sending back 200 OK and including the file again, <laughs> <laughs> then yeah, forbidden access. In, instead of sending back the file again, the server can send 304 not modified, which means the file you just requested has not changed since the last time you requested that. Therefore, use the local copy in your cache. As you know, most web browsers to improve up access times will keep a cache of the files that have been accessed recently. So if I access index.html and get a 200 OK, then I'll store that, the contents of that file in my cache on my web browser. If I request the same file again, the server may send back 304 not modified. It hasn't changed since the last time you requested. Therefore, the web browser will load up the cached version. It saves on data transfer across the network. There are many others. These aren't the only ones. Finally, not shown here, but both the request and the response may include optional header fields. Some of the header fields are listed here, some of them, there are many others. They just give some extra information either for the client to tell the server or the server to tell the client. For example, the date and time of the request. So each header field has the field name, date, followed by the value. May include the date and time, something identifying the host, say the domain name or the IP address. Uh, if you send a request, sometimes your browser prefers content in a certain type or even a certain language. Then you can specify what you prefer using some of the header fields, like indicate what character set or what language you would accept. You can give your preference, okay, I prefer the response to come in Thai rather than English. If the server has both languages for that content, it can give what you prefer. If it doesn't, it may give it the default language, or if you don't request, give any preference, it will give its default. But you can use this to tailor the resource that's requested. <coughs> 
authorization, when you access our quiz answers, what happens? When the first time you go to my website and you try to download one of those PDFs, what happens? It prompts for a username and password. So what happened there, in fact, is that you typed in or you clicked on a link to the PDF. Your web browser sent a request to the server for that PDF. The server sent back a not authorized response. You haven't supplied a username and password. And then your browser, once it receives that not authorized, it displays the prompt. Please enter your username and password. You type in your username, you type in your password, press enter. Now your browser sends a second request. This second request is the same as before, but it includes an authorization field, which includes the username and password. Sent to the server, the server checks them. Are they valid? If so, then it sends back a 200 OK, including the PDF that you requested. then the second time that your browser, when it sends that initial request, will include the authorization field. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why in your browser there's some options where you can clear the cache of your past logins okay. so that you'd have to log in again. Yeah. And there are other fields, the length of the content, the format of the content that's coming back, the type of the content, and many others. We'll see some examples shortly. So that's HTTP, send a request, requesting a URL, get a response containing the content, or if there's some problem, get some status message saying what the problem is. This just shows a, a little bit more detailed example. Okay, the user types in a URL, we send a request for a resource, we get a 200 OK back. In practice, most servers are configured. If you request the slash file, that is, you don't specify a, a file, you just give slash, or in fact, you give nothing, then the server may be configured to interpret that you mean the slash index.html file. When you configure a web server, you can specify do you mean index.html or something else or default.html or index.htm and, and similar things. So it sends back a response and the web page is displayed. Then sometime later you click on a link in that web page. When you click on the link, again you send a request for that resource. The server sends back a response. You know that in HTML you can refer to images. How would you what tag do you use to refer to images in HTML? IMG. So there's an image tag, IMG tag, you can refer to an image. When you request a HTML page and you receive it in the response, the web browser parses that HTML. Whenever it sees an image tag, the web browser recognizes, okay, now I need to request that image from the server. The image doesn't come with the HTML page. It's a separate resource. So if our test.html file contains a reference to one image, then when my web browser receives that HTML file, it automatically sends a request for the image that it refers to. And then the server sends back that image. And then that image is displayed on the screen of your browser slightly after the HTML is displayed. You'll see that sometimes where the images take a long time to display because maybe it takes a long time to transfer those images. But that request for the image is automatic by the browser. It's not triggered by the user. No, no, the, the browser doesn't handle, doesn't do any type of retransmissions. In HTTP, there's one request, one response. If you don't receive, if you don't receive a response, then TCP will, if, if something's lost across the internet, then TCP, which is used as a transport protocol, will try to retransmit. 
and if eventually there's no response, then eventually your browser will display an error, could not connect to the server if there's no HTTP response. So HTTP, send a request, get a response. TCP tries to make sure that whatever you send is delivered. If not, then you'll eventually get some error saying timed out, could not connect to server. Only in TCP. HTTP is very simple. Send a request, get a response. And we may get a 404 not found, for example. That's HTTP. Any questions? Exam question on HTTP? We're not finished. We have one example to go through. Yep. Mm. Yes. Uh, that's not a part of HTTP. All HTTP does is sends a request, receives a response. But your web browser, the application logic in web, the web browser, when it receives the HTML as a response, it reads the HTML, it passes the, the tags. And if it sees a reference to an image, then your web browser creates a new request for that image and then receives the image. What about all like, objects? And it doesn't have to be an image, it can be any object, any resource. A flash object is a file that's stored on a server. You send a request for that and you receive that resource back. And then so the web browser displays that resource on your screen. So what happens there, so you send a request for a HTML page which is, uh, and you know that that HTML page has some flash object in it. So you send a request, the HTML comes back, your browser parses that, it sees inside there there's some link to, or some object, what is a flash object? Some flash, uh, what's the, SWF. There's a, a reference to an object in that HTML, which is some flash content. Now what happens, your browser will send a request for that content and also load up, say, a plugin that can process that content, the flash player on your browser, so that the flash player now deals with that content. Okay. Same if you... Uh, request an AVI file, a video file, then the browser tells the media player, either on your operating system or embedded in the browser, to process that video file, to play it. So we send a request for that video file, receive the video, and your media player plays that video. But still from HTTP's perspective, send a request for a resource, receive that resource. Look at some example, or one example. And the example, I'm not going to do it, but I've done it, I did it yesterday. Uh, what I did, I typed in a URL, and when I did this, I actually ran some other software that captured all the messages that my computer sent and received. And we'll look at those messages. TCP dump and Wireshark. So I typed in a URL and I received this in response. So what happens in terms of the protocol exchanges to get this web page? This is what happens. Looks complex, but it's the things that we need from this is reasonably simple. In this first green area or green and blue area are the set of packets that my computer has sent and received. My computer had the address 1010 
on my laptop, it had the address, and I typed in on the in the address bar this www.google.com.au, and this is what happened in terms of packets sent and received by my computer. The first thing that happens, the first two packets there, the w one highlighted in orange, what it shows is the number of the packet, many other things happened, the time from when I started this software, the source address, the destination address, the protocol being used, and some extra information useful for that protocol. So the first packet my computer sent, this orange one, sent by my computer, sent to 10.10.10.9. What is 10.10.10.9? It's a DNS server. This is not HTTP, this is DNS working. I typed in a domain name. I need to know the corresponding IP address to be able to contact that web server. So in fact, what my computer did was sent a query to a DNS server 10.10.10.9 is the default DNS server for SIT. My computer is configured to use 10.10.10.9. I send a query saying, what is the IP address for www.google.com.au? And 10.10.10.9 sends back a reply. And the reply, the second message, The contents of that packet is listed here. It was an Ethernet frame carrying an IP datagram using IP, had a source and destination address in that IP datagram. It was using UDP as the transport protocol, and the application protocol was the DNS protocol. For example, in the UDP header, we know this one packet had a source port of 53, a destination port of 47303, a length of 323 bytes, and a checksum of some value. So all Wireshark is reporting here is the contents of each packet. Importantly, in this reply that's gone from the DNS server to my laptop is this DNS message, DNS response. A lot of details in here. If we expand and look at some of these details, we'll see one information is some mapping from domain names to IP addresses. It's slightly more complex because Google has some alias domain names. In, in <laughs> no, 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 I'll teach you to use Wireshark to look at what happens in the packet. <laughs> Only look. Why, oh, that's all Wireshark, all this software does. It captures. It doesn't inject or send packets. It captures whatever is sent. In security and cryptography, you may look at how to inject packets, how to send packets. So we can inject in various... We can inject some packets. <laughs> Let's finish this before we cover that. Here's the IP address. In fact, in this case, the Google web server, there are many IP addresses that identify the server. There's, there's many Google web servers, not just one. But note this one, 209.85.175.99. That's included in the response. The next message my computer sends to that IP address. 209.85.175.99. So that is the Google web server that we're going to communicate with. If you can read that or see that, that's fine. Google.com.au. That's the web server that we're contacting. We found the IP address in the first two messages using DNS. Let's draw our exchange up here. 
laptop, and Google. So now let's look at what happens to, to send the HTTP requests from the laptop to the Google web server. What's this message? The highlighted gray message. Exam question, here's, here's this information given to you in the exam. What's this message? <laughs> Not hard. Sin. 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 Connection. TCP connection set up, the SYN packet. We want to send a HTTP request from client to server. HTTP uses TCP as a transport protocol. And we know with TCP, before we send any data, that is before we send the request, we must establish a connection using the three-way handshake. <laughs> These three packets, the SYN, TCP SYN, packet to synchronize sequence numbers. If we look in there, we'll find the sequence number chosen. The next packet is the SYNAC coming back. That is, the SYN contains the sequence number chosen by my laptop. The SYNAC contains an acknowledgement for that and the sequence number chosen by the server. And the final one is an act. That's those three, <coughs> those three messages up until the orange one. Sin, sin act, act. We can look in the details to see the sequence numbers and the act numbers. Establish a connection. We need to do that before we transfer data. And the next message, what is it? It's the, it's the HTTP request. It is the TCP data being sent from my laptop. From TCP's perspective, don't write that yet. TCP's perspective, establish a connection, then we can send data. What is the data? The data is the HTTP request. requesting the resource that I typed into the address bar of the browser. And remember what I typed in, the domain name and then slash. So in fact, the path that I requested, shown here, the get slash and the protocol version, where the resource is just slash in this case. So the HTTP request looks like this. That's the resource, that's the method, and the version of the protocol, 1.1. And there were some header fields included in that. So again, if we look at the details of that message, zoom in on the HTTP message, there's the get, the start line, followed by optional header fields. We'll see some, my browser sent some extra information to the server so the server can tailor the response. It identifies the type of my browser, the user agent, identifies or gives preference to the different formats that I would like to receive in response. I'd like to receive HTML or XHTML and XML or just XML. I'd like to receive English in terms of language. I can accept different encodings. I could accept the, com the response to be compressed, to be zipped, or to be uncompressed. And some other header fields there. The character set I, I prefer in the encoding of the text. So this is sent in the request, so all the header fields of host, 
and all the others are included in that single request message. What's the next packet? What's the orange packet? It's a TCP acknowledgement. This was TCP data. The server sends back a TCP ACK. That's the message that we have here. Sent from the server to 10109951, my laptop. It's an ACK. And we could check the ACK numbers and check that they make sense to us. The ACK number should be the next sequence number expected. I don't know, what have we got? 336. 336 means we've received sequence numbers 1 up to 335. So the request had 335 bytes of data. So we can, and we can go back and look at the request and check that. That's just an ACK of the TCP data. Next thing. Initial sequence number was zero. Uh, which packet? Every, every segment has a sequence number included. The sequence number field is always there. There's always a value put in there. So I sent sequence number, initial sequence number I chose as zero. Every segment after that, I will set the sequence number to be one unless I include more data and I have had that data act. So the first data that I sent 10109951 sent is HTTP GET request included a sequence number. Let's see if we can find it of one. The first TCP segment, this grey one, that my laptop sent to the server had sequence number one. Initial sequence number was zero. Sequence number one. If I send segments and I, they contain no data, I will still use that same sequence number. I will only increase it once I receive acknowledgement or I'm allowed to send more data, new data. So this is the first data. The next message This message is the HTTP response. Request acknowledged, acknowledged by TCP, and then some more TCP data coming from the server to my laptop where that data is the response. And the response in this case is 200 OK. And in the response, we have some different status. Uh, we have different header fields, the date, some things about cookies, the length of the content, 12,514 bytes, some proxy server we used, and importantly, the content. That is, I requested a HTML page, and in this response message, it contains the start of that content. We can start to see it here. This is the, the content of that HTML page. You at least recognize it's some HTML markup there. It's not easy to read here. We see there's some script. The title is Google and so on. So that's the web page coming back to my laptop. What happens? What are the next packets? What does continuation mean? So we see we see the web page it's only the start of that web page. It's a large web page, 12,000 bytes. 
With 12,000 bytes, we do not try to send it in one TCP segment. It's broken into multiple TCP segments. So HTTP had 12,000 bytes of data to send, but what happens is it's sent across multiple segments. This is the first segment, and then an ACK for that segment. The second segment, and an ACK. The third segment, and an ACK. Uh, actually, it may, it may be even retransmissions in some cases. We don't sh we're not sure. That is, these are the individual TCP segments carrying the data. So the single web page is transferred as one HTTP message, but in fact multiple TCP segments, and that acts for each of those segments. If we look at the page source, what did I receive? It's not so easy to see, but at least we see there's some head in the HTML content. The title was Google, so we saw that in the packet that we captured. And if we look through all those packets, we'd see all this, which is really some JavaScript. That's why it's hard to read. It's the Google web page is made up of JavaScript. So that's what was received in those multiple TCP segments. And it was combined together and then displayed on this screen. What else? What else happens? <laughs> What's the last thing that happens? Before we close, um, in fact, the Google website has some images. There are some images. So in that HTML and in, in, in the JavaScript, there are references to other objects, other images. So if we scroll down, I don't know how long it will take, we start to see requests for some other objects. Here's a request for an image, the logo. It's in fact stored on a different server. It's not stored on the same server as the HTML page. It's on some different server, sslgstatic.com. Hence, I had to do a DNS lookup for that domain name, get an IP address, establish another TCP connection to this other IP address, request the image, and I'll receive the image in response. And in fact, there were multiple images in this web page. And then I don't have it in the capture, and then later we would find that TCP closes those connections. So do we have to do a TCP close after we finish the website serving? After some time, if you've transferred no data, then your browser will close the connection. If, if you close suddenly, then your operating si and or, or your browser crashes, then the operating system will, after some time, close the connection for you. Mm. Yeah. It will reset or abort that connection. So that illustrates HTTP, also TCP, and also DNS. You don't need to know the details of Wireshark. It's just illustrating some of those concepts coming together. Unreassembled, something to do with reassembling that packet back together. Why we not by TCP and TCP That's the the up to the implementation and the spe specifically the timing. Maybe we have yeah. together. Maybe you could. In a different case, you may see piggybacking. Hang on, we still have five minutes. We had we had some delay with someone moving down the front, so we have next five minutes. <laughs> the the if the request uh, if the res the HTTP response if the response is large then it's up to TCP to decide how to segment that into multiple segments. In our case, the response was, say, 12,000 bytes. That 12,000 bytes of data was sent to TCP. TCP made a decision to send that as multiple segments.
TCP would use the sequence numbers as we studied last or this week and last week. That is, it would just keep incrementing those sequence numbers. The sequence numbers shown here are all related to TCP, yes. That's the same as what we studied when we looked at TCP. It would be behave like that. Any further questions? Test? Exam? No.